Hey Cornerstone, my name is Natalie and welcome to Church Online. In just a little bit, we're gonna hear from our family and kids pastor, Carrie Casada, as we continue in our sheltered series. For right now, let's enter into a time of worship together. My mind is fixed on you In the valley of the waiting Spirit breathes me back to life New mercy every morning My hope has been revived I'm caught in wonder and mystery. I'm bowing long before your majesty. I'm diving in rivers of grace, wild so wide and free. Oh, oh. Never say it will be easy, just promise you never leave. No moment ever wasted, use it all to set me free. Well, I'm caught up in wonder of your mystery. Well, I'm bowing on before your majesty. I'm caught up in the wonder of your mystery. I'm bowing long before your majesty. I'm diving in the rivers of grace, wild so wild and free. Whoa. Worship His soul. 
Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord. Stone as we come together and we lift our praises to the Lord, I invite you to continue to turn your attention and affection from all other things into the Lord. Holy Spirit, would you have your way today as we come with expectation and we come with surrender to meet with you. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
bless the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. sabotaged me because he thought it would be a sweet gesture this morning to have my oldest beautiful daughter be a part of the worship team the thing that she was made to be on this earth to do and like I wasn't already a big enough wreck coming into this morning my name is Carrie I am the pastor of family and kids here at Cornerstone my husband and I the, the handsome drummer that you regularly see on Sunday mornings playing we have four kiddos, ranging from a freshman in high school down to second grade, three girls, one long-haired boy. We moved from Southern California to Colorado about seven years ago and have been a part of this Cornerstone community ever since then. 
I don't know if we're alone in this, but having four kids in virtual learning and two full-time working parents, this season has been a doozy. My husband, though, helps keep us very sane in that we laugh a lot in our house. And as I've prepared for today, I've realized that that idea of laughter and humor is such a beautiful characteristic of God. Because let me explain to you, a few months ago, Brian invited me to be a part of this sheltering season and said two things. You can have the first pick on the date and the first pick on who you want to teach on. Well, I'm closing out this series because I picked the last possible date I could. And I also came across a piece of art by one of my favorite artists, Scott Erickson, about a picture of Jonah. And it jumped off the screen and I knew that Jonah was exactly who I was supposed to teach on. But see, here's the issue. Jonah's not as easy as we have made his story to be in the kid story realm. I'm a kid's pastor and you might be thinking, of course, she picked the easy kid story. The story that many of us have grown up in the church have heard from someone like myself or maybe a Sunday school pastor or possibly from a singing cucumber named Larry. But see, the problem is, is that we've veggie-tailed the heck out of this story. We've highlighted the glamorous, over-the-top parts, and as a result, we've watered it down to a very bland moral truth. We've shied away from the really hard-to-swallow reality of what God is showing us through Jonah about our humanness and his wide and vast grace and mercy. Well, all that humor aside, I have to be honest with you. This sermon has not been easy for me to prepare for, for many reasons, some of them being fear, but a lot of it is because in preparing for today, I've been brought to the end of myself. This season has been a trying one for me, and it set me in proximity to a God, though, that loves me and holds all things together. So I wanna thank you for being here with me today, allowing me to walk through a season and hearing my story. So let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you are a God that is in control of all things. That when our lives are in the midst of a storm, that you draw us to you. God, I pray that you draw us in today. I pray, God, that my words would not be my words, but that they would be yours. That you would fill the spaces in our homes today, the places where we've gathered to do church together, God, and that you would be present there and that your voice would speak loudly. I thank you, God, for today and all that you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've spent several weeks now talking through what God does in these sheltering seasons. We've talked about shaping and how he shapes us in the waiting like David, or how he's called us to a bigger story like running with horses. We've also talked some about how he meets us in our isolation and depression and calls us to move towards one another. Well, as I thought I had chosen for myself one of the hardest, most difficult possible sheltering stories, because let me explain, spoiler alert, it doesn't end so well for Jonah. What I did come to see and what I have to share with you today is that God actually, through Jonah's story, has a very simple, beautiful truth to show us. How sheltering seasons take us back to the basics. They're meant to remind us of who we are, that we are deeply loved children of God. And then when we resist him in that love, he chases after us to meet us with his grace and mercy. And out of that, he calls us to move towards one another. I want to give you a little bit of background today about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, a.k.a. he was simply a messenger of God. But you see, Jonah was not the typical, so the word of the Lord came to, and then we read all of Jonah's amazing words, because here's the problem. Jonah's words were only five, and they were really pathetic at that. And what God actually is doing is he's telling a story and telling us that the message through Jonah's story, not exactly through Jonah's words. 
There's some debate in the biblical scholar world about whether or not this Jonah story is historical narrative or whether or not it's a parable. I'm just going to stop right there because here's the problem. It completely derails us from the point. The point that God's redeeming love chases after us and it flows through us with so much power and grace that we are able to love and bless others, even our worst enemies. I personally think that actually the book of Jonah is one of the brilliant, most brilliantly told stories in the Bible, because here's the deal. It's comical satire. It is full of wit and irony, humor, sarcasm, and it's extreme in every possible way. Everyone acts in this story in the complete opposite way than you would expect. And like any good satire, I don't know if I have any other fellow SNL fans, but like any good satire, we get to watch it or read it, laugh, but then we have to step back and we go, oh. Because you see, the cleverness of these types of writing is that the character often in this, in satires, are holding up a mirror to reflect back at us our not so great tendencies. This story, Jonah's story, would be an absolute breeze to read and teach on if it was about someone else. But see, the problem is, it's not about someone else. It's about us, you and me. And my journey in the last seven months of this quarantine has showed me that the sheltered 2020 carry lines up real closely to the sheltered Jonah. I have gone through this season noticing that I am angry. I am distracted, self-righteous, I am a runner, and I am broken. But I think the greatest comparison that has come out between me and Jonah is that I struggle with getting the basics, just like he did. My inability to absorb the goodness of God's love and grace and allow it to draw me in. And allow it to draw me in so that God can spit me back out looking more like him. While attention brews and from sentence two of Jonah's book, we see it. The Lord calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. Here's the deal with Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital, Syria, capital city of Assyria. And man, did that city have a reputation. Not a good one. That this, it was a great massive empire and what they were known for was their brutality. They were the most murderous, suppressive people the world had ever known. I don't know how else to say it except that they were just bad, bad people. And they were the Israelites' bitter enemies. Well, God tells his messenger, I want you to head in the direction of those enemies because I need you to deliver a message for me, a message of judgment, but yet a message of me calling those people back to me. Jonah's call was really simple. God was simply saying, Jonah, you are a part of my loved children, and I want you to take that identity and give it away to someone else. But you see, Jonah, it wasn't that simple. And as we know, he ran. He ran in the complete opposite direction, like as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could get. He gets on a ship full of pagan sailors and takes off for Tarshish. We could call that Timbuktu. I mean, we, he couldn't have gone farther than that. Well, and we know as we read his story that there was probably various reasons for him running, probably fear, selfishness, pain, hate, because you see, he and his fellow Israelites, they had created a very dualistic way of seeing the world. They had done this good versus bad, sinner versus saint, us versus them. And us, being Jonah here, couldn't possibly think of a world with them in it. So to try to save them was out of the question for him. And what we see later on is that he actually becomes furious when them and God become pretty chummy. See, but here realize that reflection, that mirror back at us. How true are these things of us? 
That when God calls us to move out of fear, when God calls us, we often move out of fear. Or we move out of our pain and our hurt. Or we move out of our us versus them circles that we've maybe intentionally or not created. Out of our entitled opinions about what we think is best for the world at large. And we become very selective at times with God's grace. I want to tell you a story today about a 20-year-old Carrie. In my early 20s, I ran into a pretty life-altering tension story like this. And in my conversations with many of you over the years at Cornerstone, I've come to see that I am not the only one with this kind of story. I grew up in the church. I did all the Jesus-y things. Went to Awanas, memorized all the verses, did the emotional campfire nights, missions trips all over the world. I got taught a lot of really good God information. Well, into my college years, I go, and at that point, I was pretty sure I had it all figured out. But what I was unaware of is, as we many of us know that have already walked through that season of life, that is a season of great tension. It's a season of our lives where we move from being an adolescent into being a full-fledged adult. And in that process, we have to do a lot of tearing apart of the things we've been given, deconstructing the ideas that whether it's been our family has taught us or the church has taught us, but we do that where we have to unravel it to figure out who we are and who we are in light of God, what faith and life and all those things look like for us. Well, during those years, I was actually working for the church that I had grown up in, and I was fleshing out a lot of that who am I and who is God's stuff. And as you can guess, some tensions began to rise between the church and my understanding of faith in Jesus. Well, you may assume that, that me working for the church in that tension didn't end so well. And my husband and I had to walk away from the church that we had known for many years, walked away very hurt, and a common phrase that many of us have used at times is the idea that I felt very burned by the church. I felt I had in that, year, in that moment every right to be at arms with the church, to form a narrative that they were the other. And the last thing I was interested in doing was seeing that I was broken just like the church and needed God's grace to cover us both. Well, it took years of me running, being angry, self-righteous, to pull back and see that in that season, God was working to heal me and calling me to step into his grace for me, his child. That I wasn't able to extend his grace on my enemy because I hadn't absorbed it myself. And at the end of the day, despite hurt and opinions and conflict in what the church should look like, that I am called to stand under the banner of his love as his child alongside his other children. Here's the ironic part. I got vomited <laughs> right back out into his body here at Cornerstone, the exact place that I had resisted for so long. So I have some Jonah tendencies myself. I ran much like Jonah did. And Jonah took off, like I said that day, and ran in the complete opposite direction. And as he was on the boat, he went down into the hull of the ship and he fell asleep, which is such an interesting piece to his apathy, I think. And as he's sleeping, a storm, a fierce storm rolls in and the sailors on deck start freaking out. They're throwing everything overboard. They're crying out to their gods asking, please make this storm stop. They're desperate. Well, the captain looks, realizes, he turns to his right and his left and realizes that this guy named Jonah that he had remembered boarded the ship is nowhere to be seen. So he goes down and he looks for him and he finds him asleep and he wakes him up and he starts asking him all kinds of questions. He says, who are you? What are you doing here? What is going on and where are you going? Well, Jonah's answer is quite hilarious. It's a whole lot of religious mumbo jumbo. 
<laughs> he says, I am a Hebrew, a.k.a. I'm a child of God. And I worship the God of heaven and the creator of this sea and dry land. I mean, what a joke, right? He's professing in that moment that he worships the creator of the sea, yet he was a fool enough to get on a boat on that same sea and run away from that creator. Well, the storm begins to rage even more, and the sailors start putting it all together. They're realizing that that God that Jonah professed is the creator of the sea is pretty mad at Jonah. And so they look at Jonah and they say, what should we do? And we could read at first glance that Jonah's reply is kind of heroic in some ways. It's noble. He says, yeah, it's my fault. Throw me overboard. But what we actually realize if we look deeper is that he's actually, it was a total coward move. It was a further step of going against God's call. He was saying, I'd rather die than have you turn this boat around so that I can repent and go back. He put his blood on their hands. And they tried in every way to prevent from killing him. They asked God, please let there be another option. And they tried to turn the boat back to a shore, but the, the storm raged on. So they throw Jonah overboard, ask God for forgiveness. And as soon as Jonah hit the water, the storm stopped. And those pagan sailors in that moment stood in awe of the creator. And they vowed and they worshiped and they sacrificed to him. Because, guys, here's the funny part. God works even in our worst moments. Jonah begins his journey into descending into the sea at this moment. And he is certain that this is the end. This is the end of his life. Well, what comes next in the narrative is so amazing. If you want to turn with me to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, the verse right before chapter 2 says... Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You see, God snatched him up in that downward spiral, and into the belly of a beast, Jonah goes. And this picture is so interesting because I think it's Pinocchio's fault. We have this idea that he's inside this cave, like this big whale's stomach with like a little fire brewing and all the things. But actually, that would have probably been far from the case. He was cramped. He's marinating in there with other fish and seaweed and stomach acid, just the most gross possible environment that I think we could think of. A dark, confined, confusing space. Well, this image of Jonah curled into a ball in the belly represents seasons that we have all faced, the dark depths, the valleys of our life. And maybe we get to this place because of our own choices like Jonah, or maybe it's because someone else's foolishness has spilled over into our lives, or sometimes there's no real reason or person or place to blame, like possibly the season that we're in right now in 2020. But regardless of how we get to that dark place, this darkness isn't lost on God. Because you see, in the darkness comes a loving, gracious God that draws us to himself. God pulled Jonah out of a mess he had created to speak to him in the quiet of a fish's belly. We don't know a whole lot about those three days, but what we do see is that at the end of it, there's a prayer. But before that prayer, all I can imagine is that there was real uncomfortable silence for Jonah. I mean, I guess as silent as it can be with the strange noises of a digestive system of a fish, but it was quiet. We aren't told in this account if God spoke at all, if he spoke loudly, if he spoke clearly, but what we do see is that he was there. You see, God speaks in the silence, in the stillness. It is said that God's voice is the sound of silence, the place where he wants to remind us of the basics when the world around us is spinning out of control 
or are we are slumping down into the darkness. As many of us know, on March, I think 17th or 18th around there, our worlds abruptly shrunk down. We were put into a quarantine as suddenly as it possibly could have come. And it was kind of crazy because it was this forced shutdown. And in many ways, the outside world was removed. The noise was hushed and we were sitting quietly in our homes. Don't get me wrong, because this season, sheltering season for many of us has been quite terrible. But what I want to tell you is that I have felt strongly that the Lord in those months was drawing me in. He was quieting the noise all around me and setting me down at his feet. But here's the problem. I'm really, really bad at being still. It takes the control out of my hands. And I am really good at resisting. I wiggled and squirmed my way around in the quiet of this quarantine. You guys, what is it about quiet that is so hard for us? Why is it so much easier to surround ourselves with noise and going and doing and all of that than to stop and be silent? I know for me, it has a lot to do with being uncomfortable. Jonah had to have been so uncomfortable in the belly of that fish. And how funny is it that we so often feel the same way when we are quiet at the Lord's feet. And I think that uncomfortableness comes out of our lack of control and a lot of fear that we have. I think we don't like to get quiet because we're afraid. We're afraid that we won't hear God. We're afraid we're going to hear him wrong. We're afraid of the shame of being exposed. We're afraid of what God might ask us to do, what control we might have to give up. We have a fear, I think, a deep-seated fear of being fully seen and ultimately having to sit with the fullness of his grace. Well, my friends, all that fear is a lie. It is not based in God's truth. It is not from him. We so often give in to those lies and resist the quiet because we're afraid of the very opposite thing God has to offer us there. 2020 has been uncomfortable in so many ways, but it has exposed how not okay we are with being uncomfortable. How much we grasp to fill our lives with noise instead of pushing past the distractions and settling into his voice. And let me tell you, I'm way better at allowing the distractions to have my ear. And man, I don't know if you are the same, but the distractions on this side of that quarantine have been loud. And I don't think that that's by any coincidence. I think the enemy right now wants nothing more than to stop us from being quiet. And as a result, he's hitting us with one distraction after another, like a lot of really loud noise. Just think about it. Our news feeds right now, our social media, various medical professional opinions that we're hearing, the education that we're being told about how there is great injustice in our world and we need to know more about it. Here's the thing, it's not all bad by any means, it's not all bad, but I do think it's a sneaky type of distraction. One that is spotlighting the way that our world is broken, because we're seeing it. It's broken here and it's broken there. And we as kingdom builders need to listen and we need to be in the know because we need to know how to fix it. But see, here's the thing. I think in the sea of noise, something really ugly has emerged. Something completely contrary to the basic truths that God's drawing us into here. An us versus them mentality has grown, and with it has come a lot of opinions and a lot of entitlement to those opinions. I mean, think about it. We have opinions about everything right now. Opinions about our political leadership. Opinions about decisions being made in our school districts. Opinions about what's best for our community with COVID regulations. How we should be doing church together. Opinions about the racial tension in our country and how it should be handled. 
and we are gripping so tight to those opinions that it's causing us to raise our fists and fighting one another. But what if this season was not about those opinions and not about that, that noise, but it was about God drawing us closer to him, to sit at the quiet of his feet, to hear him, to turn it all off and just be, to just sit with him. Maybe there we would find true rest and a calm in our storm. What we see is at the end of the three days for Jonah, he begins to form words and cries out to his God. He cries out with a prayer of surrender and repentance. Kind of repentance. I wanted to share with you about my 2019. Last year was a really rough year for me for a lot of reasons. I came to the end of January of 2019, and I am, my friend said, is it 2020 yet? And now the irony of that statement is so funny. But um, it began in January where um, the brokenness of a close friend's decisions stirred up a storm in my life and in the life of my community. My friends were hurting, and I was hurting. At that same time, um, one of my daughters began to struggle with a new level of anxiety. And for any other parents that have walked through that with your kids, it is not a rough, it's not an easy season to walk through. Much excitement began to brew around the Dream Boulder project here at Cornerstone. And I have to tell you what it stirred up in me was a lot of past wounds and a lot of past hurt with my struggle like I shared with the church. But God, so God and I had a lot to sort through last year. And here's my tendencies. When things get hard, I pile on the yeses. And I begin to say yes to everybody and everything. And I allow my yeses to far outweigh me being quiet and taking care of myself. I did come to the end of 2019, though, and stepped into counseling, something that I had resisted for most of my life, but now I see it's actually a beautiful life-giving gift. I was trying my very best to hold it together last year. Well, then, following a really very dark week in November, I, walk, I woke up one Monday morning feeling nauseous, a feeling that I assumed was, really, was related to my stress and anxiety, from the week before. But what I found out was it was not about stress. I was actually pregnant. And this pregnancy, yes, number five, we endearingly named the baby Cinco. Um, this pregnancy was one of those were what in the world kind of pregnancies. I will save you from all the details, but my husband and I had done all the things to be done at baby number four. So this was a complete shock. I was in denial, lots and lots of tears, disbelief, and asking God, I don't know what in the world you're doing, but I was not planning to have another baby. Well, the disbelief within just a few short days actually turned to a really strange piece. The reality that this new life would be new life for me on so many levels for my home, for my kids, for my marriage, for our community that had been through so much brokenness. A miracle that made no sense, but complete sense at the same time. I was reading my journal from that time this week and I wrote, had written this. My soul has been, been reset, a turning over to grow life, newness, to study me. My emotions have settled like the calming of a storm. Dark places are being taken over with warmth and light. Two weeks went by and another Monday came. I went into my first doctor's appointment and there was no heartbeat there. That light and life growing within me was no longer alive. I truly believe that no one feels grief as deep as someone who has lost a child. No parent should have to face the loss of their child. 
And in my crying and weeping, it was interesting to see that the God that was holding me said, I know we hold this in common. The week we lost the baby were the darkest days I've ever walked. I was drowning in pain. We sat on our couch with our kids, just sitting in silence, in the quiet, in tears. I had no words to say, no words to even pray, but my dear friends prayed on my behalf. They found the words that I couldn't find. When I came to a place of finding words, they were words of desperation, words of anger saying, God, why in the world would you give me this upside down miracle just to take it away? And they were words of fatigue. How much more God can I take? I had come to the end of myself in every sense of the phrase. What we see is that Jonah too came to the end of himself. He turns to prayer, throwing up his hands in surrender, and he says these words. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. You see, Jonah here says a few different things. He says that God hears him. And then he also says, and he proclaims that God has a hand in this dark space. That his fingerprints were all over it. My rock bottom last year resulted in a very similar prayer. I cried out and said, God, I know you are here. I experienced a closeness of the Lord like never before a covering of his presence in my absolute darkest moments. He was there. And it also was, God, I had to acknowledge you are the giver of life. Your fingerprints are all over this. You have formed my family and you hold us in your hands. And I trust you even though I don't understand. See, Jonah begins to put it all into perspective. And in this moment, in the dark belly of that fish, he comes face to face with those basic truths that God is trying to get through to him. He realizes that God has called him his child, that God chased him down with a severe mercy, and that God is calling him to give that mercy away to others. I just want to talk for a second about that severe mercy. I mean, how much more severe can mercy get that when you are on your attempt at drowning yourself at sea, running away from God, you are swallowed by a fish? That word mercy in the Hebrew is actually most t closely tied to the word hesed, which means loving kindness. It's actually, Jean has spoken about it many times. It's a word that we actually in our English language can't fully put words to because it's so deep. That loving kindness that the Lord shows us. And in this moment, Jonah realizes that God might not have caused this moment of darkness that he had felt, but that it was his loving kindness that had pursued him and was caring for him there. And I understand that this is a really hard concept for us to wrap our heads around, especially when we are in the depths of these seasons. Because you see, we want to take often our circumstances and we want to allow them to write a narrative about God. I mean, one of the most common kid questions I get, and let's be honest, it's an adult question too, is how can a loving God allow bad things to happen to his children? You see, in our humanness, we struggle to not blame God in a how could you do this way. But instead, we have to step back and see these seasons as, a, as he being a loving father drawing us to himself. Following my miscarriage, I had some serious why moments. Moments that I had to throw my hands up in complete surrender and come to the end of myself. But see, the paradox that I realized was that that was the best possible place for me to be. 
These whale time moments in our lives bring us to the end of ourselves, which allows us to discover the truth of who we really are, that we are mere frail humans, not as in control as we thought. And we're unraveled to meet the hands of our loving creator who calls us his child and who loves us so deeply that he will even command a fish to swallow us so that he can drown us in his grace and mercy that we can't fully understand. And that crunched up ball inside the belly of the whale, we're met with a God that pursues us, a God that loves us with such hesed that he chases after us, a God that is committed to us no matter how far we run or mess up, or how deep we drop. I wish so badly today that I could put a pretty bow on top of Jonah's story here. And I could say, and he lived happily ever after, remembering all those basic truths, the end. But from the, we know from the cramped intestinal system of a fish, Jonah gets projectile vomited out. And he, flailing through the air with bile and vomit and half-decomposed fish, lands in the exact place that he was supposed to be. And there, covered in God's mercy from head to toe, I mean, he was likely bleached out and totally covered in fish vomit. He, God speaks to him and he says, get up and go, because I want to deliver a message I have given you. So he starts off, and in one day, he forgets. He very, very quickly forgets all that God had given him in that belly of the fish. He makes his way into the city, and he gives a really sad and pathetic five-word sermon. Doesn't even mention the the name of God in it. And with those five words, though, God works. You see... The beauty of God is that he works not despite us, but he works even in our disobedient, stubborn ways. When we are being a huge pain, he still works. And with those five words, that giant, evil, horrible city of 120,000 people, a revival happens. They repent, they humble themselves, They completely surrender to God. And when God acts exactly in step with his character, he forgives the Ninevites. Jonah can't handle it. He stops off outside the city and he throws a whole fit. And at the end of it, God comes to him multiple times with one simple question. He says, Jonah, my child, is it right for you to be angry? You see, the unresolved nature of Jonah and this question is, I think, the last mirror moment in this story. It's a chance for us to look at our own lives. I'll tell you even today, I was really weary about coming to you and sharing with you about my miscarriage because I'm still really unsure about what the resolve is in that story. I can't even put a pretty bow on top because I think I'm still in process, much like Jonah is. So I'm thankful for the Lord for Jonah's story, that when he brings us through a season intended for renewal, it may take longer than just our time in the darkness. Friends, I don't want you to miss what God is doing in this season. May we come out of this sheltering tethered to those simple basic truths, the gospel in its purest form, that God longs to draw us to him to make us new, that God's character is purely love, that he gave his son's life for us to reconcile us back to him through his grace, and that out of that he calls us to be his ambassadors of his son's great love. He's calling us to be his bride in this season. To stand as his beloved, fully loved, fully known, 
And yes, he knows we're going to run. And fully covered. And inviting us to stand together in the beautiful white covering of his mercy. I'd like to bless you all today as we close. May you come through this sheltering season not forgetting who the Lord is and who you are in light of him. May we be people who settle in to how God sees us and blankets us with mercy so that we can come from that rock-solid place. To soak his grace into the depths of our being and to stop being stubborn and defensive people and pour out his mercy on others. Grace and peace to you, my friends. Thanks for that message, Carrie, and for being so open and vulnerable with all of us. I have a couple of quick announcements before you go. In a few weeks, we're gonna be starting our new teaching series on Sundays. We're really excited about this one. It's called Peacemakers, a Ministry of Reconciliation. And our hope is that this is more than just something that we listen to on Sundays, that it becomes a ministry of reconciliation and a movement within Cornerstone, a way forward through the social unrest we're all experiencing and a bright light in our community. So in addition to our Sunday sermons, we're also gonna have some special events, some panels, some group discussion, where we can enter into divisive subjects together in community with a kingdom mindset. So we'll be telling you about those in the weeks to come, but this series will start in a few weeks and we're really looking forward to it. We hope you can join us. If you're new to our community, we would love to get you connected to one of our online or in-person groups. Simply go to our homepage, cornerstoneboulder.org, click on the I'm new button to get started. We'll be in contact soon and we hope that you find that Cornerstone is a place where you can belong and connect to what matters. One of our core elements here at Cornerstone is generosity. And thanks to your generosity over the last several months, we've been able to continue our Dream Boulder project and support all of our local and global partners. If you would like to partner with us, you can find secure ways to give right on our website or our app. That's it for me. Stay classy, Cornerstone, and we'll see you all next week.